Uh, let me introduce uh, Professor Kuranajewski to our audience today. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, today, Vishu Bharati lecture series is going to be held by Professor Bob Kuranajewski. It is my immense pleasure to take the opportunity to formally introduce Professor Kuranajewski with our audience today. Dr. Bob Kolonodinsky, today's speaker. He is the professor of management in the College of Business at James Madison University, Virginia, USA, where he teaches and researches on topics related to organizational behavior, leadership and coaching, and interpersonal skills. He earned his PhD degree in business administration from Florida State University with special emphasis on organizational behavior and human resource management. Now, in his 19 years stint at JMU, he has won several scholarships and services awards for his contribution to the field of teaching. The College of Business Outstanding MBA Graduate Teaching Award and the Provost Award for Community Service, to name a few. As a career faculty associate with JMU's Center for Faculty Innovation, Dr. Kolodinsky delivered monitoring and coaching workshops and also mentors faculty members. Bob has taught internationally, including China and India. He enjoys working with social enterprises on ways to create shared value and enhance workers' well-being. So that's a snippet of Professor Kolodinsky's professional life. Let's have some tidbit from his personal. Bob is married to Corey, a practicing counseling psychologist who compliments him both professionally and personally. He and Corey have an amazing 13 year old daughter who keeps both herself and her parents busy with her middle school activities. Currently, Bob is in the process of getting certified as a business leadership coach and launching a new leadership coaching business. We wish him all the best in this new endeavor. So that's Professor Bob Kalinodinsky, our today's speaker. Once again, on behalf of the entire Vishwabharati fraternity, I would like to thank Professor Kalinodinsky for accommodating uh, this lecture session amidst his busy schedule. We are truly honored, sir. May I now request Professor Kulinidoski to take charge about this session? So please, thank you. Thank you so much for the wonderful introduction. And I'm so happy to be here with, with you all and with um, members of the Chakrabarti family. Um, and um, I know that uh, Dr. Chakrabarti is here in spirit and hopefully in person via Zoom soon. It is absolutely a pleasure to share with you a, a practice that I am becoming certified in that I've learned has been widely used in organizations throughout uh, the North American region, uh, in many places in Europe, and probably, probably, uh, also in India and other parts of the world. It is a passion of mine, so much so that I am starting my fourth business uh, very soon this summer and will be, uh, I, I regularly coach and I'll, I'll define that a little bit later what coaching is. I regularly coach uh, executives in the nonprofit and for-profit world I coach faculty members and academic unit heads, uh, commonly called department chairs. I give workshops uh, on a variety of topics, including this one today. So I'm going to I'm going to share my screen with today's topic: leadership toolkit, adding a coaching process to enhance leader effectiveness. And you can see there's some a byline there and empower your colleagues and improve well-being. So your own and others' well-being. And so this is going to be a little bit of an unusual workshop in that it will be somewhat interactive. I have some Zoom polls. 
I have, uh, I'm going to ask you to be active in the chat box. And I'm also going to later in the session, uh, ask you to apply what we've discussed today. So you're actually going to pair off in breakout rooms one-on-one -on -one, and maybe sometimes uh, a, a group of three if there's um, an odd number of folks in the room. Right now I see there's 48 total, um, including me. So there would be 47. So obviously there'd be an odd number and we'll see how, how many are in the room at the time that we go into the breakout rooms. But you will actually play the role based on some of the content that I will be sharing with you, you'll play the role of either coach or of coachee. And then after that, we will switch. We'll come back into the room and talk about it. And then we will switch and you'll play the opposite role. So everybody will get a chance to be a coach or a coachee. And so uh, I hope you'll enjoy this session. It is highly interactive as i said it is meant to be a practice session a a true workshop not just a lecture uh, i will be sharing quite a bit of content and the content will come from both theory and from practice uh, there are uh, quite a few evidence-based uh, areas that i will be sharing with you to to convince uh, and hopefully persuade you that uh, coaching is a very real and impactful device employed by some of the best leaders. And so with that, uh, I'm going to get started, if that's okay. I see that we're recording, and we're, we're going to get started now. So here's my first slide. Um, our goals for today include to increase your listening skills. There's a self-serving bias that often occurs with people in all manner of behaviors in life. And one is that we tend to think we're better listeners than others think we are. And so um, going by the premise that maybe we could improve, each of us could improve our listening skills, I'm going to be sharing three levels of listening and we're going to practice the highest level, the most impactful level, the best level, the most effective level today. So increase listening skills is a goal and increase our ability to ask what are called powerful questions. And I'll share what powerful questions are later, but in essence, these are questions that really can unpeel the layers of the onion to get closer to the core of what an issue is for a person who wants to solve an issue, solve a problem. And so we often talk about in, in the coaching world and now leaders in organizations in uh, broadly or around the world talk about how there's often a gap between where a person is developmentally and professionally and even personally and where they want to be. And coaching is used to help get to what that gap is and help the person come up with solutions that fill that gap. And I'll, that'll make more sense in a little bit. So these two aspects are what we're gonna focus primarily on today, improving our listening skills and improving our ability to ask certain types of questions. And I'll share more about what those questions are soon. And thirdly, consider how coaching might in all of your interactions, whether you're in a supervisory role or not, whether you're in a um, leadership, whether you can see yourself as a leader or not, what I'm hoping that by the end of this time together, you'll recognize the value in applying coaching techniques to build relationships, to strengthen relationship bonds, and to build the perception of others uh, from others to you of your leadership. In other words, to increase your leadership perceptions of you as a leader, as assessed by others. And secondly, to increase those up arrows or just increase engagement and empowerment. So if regardless of your role as a worker in an organization, by using techniques the, the coaching techniques that I'm going to share with you, I am suggesting and the literature strongly suggests that this is 
a way to increase engagement in the workplace. And I'll share some of the research on engagement in a little bit and how important it is to organizational outcomes and empowerment. So if, there, if questions are asked in the right way, if listening is done in a way that deeply shows that a person deeply cares, it can be incredibly empowering to the person to help them solve their own issues. And what we want as leaders, as people in leadership roles, is not to micromanage people, not to constantly have our workers come to us for solutions, but rather create conditions where everyone feels empowered to solve their own problems so that everybody can get their work done and that the leader's not overwhelmed by all of these requests. And this will become even clearer a little bit later, but those are our goals for today's session. So, so we're gonna practice. We're gonna practice coaching later. And depending on how much time is used at the time that we go to the coaching sessions, we may be in uh, coaching for six, seven minutes or maybe as much as 10 or more minutes if there's enough time. And believe me, it is incredible how much can be shared in even five or six or seven minutes. You, I think, if you haven't ever done this kind of exercise or really thought about how much can be shared in a five or seven minute period or 10 minute period, I think you'll be amazed. So, and it can be so revealing. And one of the really critical parts of all of this is that I'm going to ask you, and this is going to be directed at some of you and maybe not all of you, I'm going to ask you to get out of your comfort zone when you're playing the role of the coachee, not the coach. If you're on the other side of the Zoom table, in a sense, I'm going to ask you to be vulnerable, to share things that maybe you don't typically share with many people, if anyone, uh, so that so that the coaching session is more valuable. So even in the short time that you'll be coached, and then we'll switch and you'll be, a, you'll be a coach or a coachee first, and then we'll switch later. In the short time that you're a coachee, the person being coached, share, I'm gonna ask you to share an issue that you really wanna solve, a problem that you have a gap between where you are and where you wanna be. And, be willing to be vulnerable about it. Why is it such a problem? Why haven't you been able to figure this out? Why hasn't it gone better? And this will all make sense more as I share with you some of the possible questions that might kickstart the coaching session. We'll also be taking a, a, a short break um, after about, oh, 40 minutes or so. Um, I have a slide that shows a break in it and we'll see, I'll look at the time and, and measure, see how, how far along we are and see if we need a break at that time. So first, I'm going to offer a Zoom poll. So everybody, uh, and I'm going to ask you also, I know that in Zoom, and I, I, I just finished a class, my fifth coaching class, where I am a student in a coaching class getting certified. And I know that there's a tendency in Zoom to uh, easily be distracted, uh, to have uh, email on one part of the screen or a different monitor or to check one's phone for text messages. And I'm gonna ask you if you would mind respectfully to try to stay absolutely focused. And I have uh, two reasons for that. One is if you're absolutely focused on what we're gonna to discuss today, there's a much greater likelihood that you're gonna learn. And secondly, this is part of being a great coach in coaching others. And I'm suggesting that maybe none of you will ever become a certified coach and make it your profession like I am making with my new business. But I'm suggesting strongly that if you were to coach others in the way that we're going to discuss, you will create those outcomes, a greater leadership bond, greater leadership perceptions of you, greater engagement with your workforce and greater empowerment, the person will be able to better solve their own issues. So it, there's a twofold reason for asking you to stay focused and try hard not to be distracted by email or other things during this session. So first, here's our first poll. So if you'll get ready to answer this, there's 
uh, several questions, four questions, and I'm going to launch the poll and I'll wait for uh, about 90% to answer before I uh, share the results. So don't look up the first one, just take a wild guess as to how many leadership books are published. So far, eight have responded out of 46. So I'm hoping to get a much, much larger number. I've got to turn off my, I forgot to turn off my sound. Now we're at only 11 out of 46. So I'm hoping to get a whole bunch more people to respond. We're up to 15. And I realize that English may not be a first language for everyone. And so perhaps it's taking a little bit longer. And English is my only language. I learned a little bit of Spanish, but I really regret not spending more time with other languages. Siddharth, I, I saw a hand up. Okay, perhaps not. Okay, we're up to 21 out of 46. Maybe we'll wait till we get to about 60% instead of 90%. Okay, we are close. So I'm going to end the polling and share the results. So believe it or not, there are more than 10,000 business books printed in English in the United States every year. And more than half of those, so 5,000 or more are leadership related books. And so my point in asking this question and making this comment is that leadership, everybody seems to have an opinion about leadership or has um, an approach to leadership that ostensibly differs from what's been written before. But this is on an annual basis, more than 5,000 leadership books are printed every year in English in the United States. And so, uh, Leadership is, is obviously something that publishers believe uh, is important and that people want to buy. Um, some of these books sell millions uh, each year. And I'm going to share with you shortly one of the most popular books and ask a question at that time. Uh, they have a particular approach to leadership that I like and that I use in my MBA teaching. So the answer to first one, and there's not a right answer, uh, you know, in terms of don't feel bad if you didn't put 5,000, uh, but it is, it's an eye opener. That's why I put it there. Number two, my work satisfaction would be higher if I had better work relationships. And interestingly, 88% of the respondents said yes, if they had better work relationships it would be higher and zero said unlikely. So everyone said either possibly 
or absolutely to that question. And so uh, on one hand, that's sad that work relationships aren't optimal. On the second hand, it makes me very happy that this workshop could actually make a difference. Relatedly, so the second question is about work satisfaction. The third is about work productivity would be higher if I had better work relationships. And again, zero said unlikely. And 67% said absolutely. And so therein lies uh, some of what I'll be sharing as evidence from some meta-analyses later. And I won't hit you over the head with too much theory or too much um, uh, evidence or statistics, uh, but I want you to understand that there's credibility behind what coaching can do. And so there's greater and increasing evidence for the value of coaching in work settings. And so here we go. Number three basically suggests that most or all of you could have better work relationship, or if you had better work relationships, you would be more productive. Again, so much of what's important it, to our employers is what are we producing? Are we, are we a good value for our organizations? Number four, I have had a leader who cared deeply about me and my professional development. And 67% said true in my case. Um, eight, out of 24, 33%, so a third, say no. They've, they've never had a leader, it sounds like, never had a leader that cared about them and about their professional development. And so how sad that is um, and how great it is to have, for those of you who have had a leader, um, I have had several, uh, I have, I've had several companies. I've also worked for some organizations. Then I became an academic and I've had several deans and several academic unit heads. And in that time, I would say about a third of the people that I reported to really deeply cared about me and cared about my professional development and would take me aside and ask me how I'm doing and, and ask me what's important to me and ask me uh, if they can help in any way. And that always led me to walk away from their offices, this is pre-pandemic, um, feeling better about my life, about my work, about them, and about my organization. And so that's one of the big takeaways that I hope you take away today as we finish up later, you'll say, my workplace, if we had, if we had stronger work relationships, could create greater well-being and greater productivity and greater work satisfaction. And I know how to do that now, or I know, I know at least one way how to do that. And that is to be a better listener and to ask good questions. And I'll talk about those good, powerful questions in a little bit. So I'm gonna go ahead and get rid of the poll and move to the next one. So for those of you who are in a leadership role, what's your leadership emphasis? Is it more toward task orientation and getting things done? Is it more toward people or is it some balance between the two? And there are some issues with each of these. And what about when you're under pressure, when there, you're under an extreme deadline? Most of you would probably say that you pivot, even if you are more people oriented, that you pivot more to task because you've got to get, you got to meet the deadline. You're feeling pressure to meet a deadline. And so um, that's understandable, but just know that there can be collateral damage occurring when you lean heavily more into task and don't, aren't sensitive to the impacts of your behavior on others. And so sort of moving backwards to each of these, if you tend to be, or, a or your boss tends to be very task oriented, it can feel to others, and if, if, you're if you're thinking about your boss, to you, very transactional. Like all they care about is me putting forth effort, me getting things done so that they can get their work done or produce uh, and meet their goals and, then that will feel not like a, a human relationship, but an exchange relationship, a quid pro quo. I, 
you do this for me, I do this for you. And then I get paid uh, and I go home. Um, that can feel very stifling in a workplace. And it all too often, people are under pressure, people are overwhelmed, and they pivot more toward task accomplishment and less toward caring about people. There's a downside to caring too much about people and ignoring task or not paying attention to task accomplishment, deadlines and so on. And it can a person could be seen as too friendly and others could take advantage of that person. And so some, some balance is necessary. Something in between. There's probably an ideal and every individual, every leader, every setting, every situation is a little bit different. And, it, and the timing of leaning into task or leaning more toward caring about people and spending time with people is something that is a skill that has to be developed over time. What I'm suggesting is in most workplaces, the focus on task is a little too high. And the focus on caring about others, because let's face it, almost all work is interdependent work. My work depends on you getting your work done so that I can get my work done and vice versa. Organizations have goals. Units, departments have goals. How do those goals get done? Usually not in just individual silos. More often than not, people rely on others so that a project can get done. So if that's the case in your case, then I'm suggesting that if you're a leader, you're in a leadership role, it might benefit you to lean in a little bit more, if you can see my cursor, toward people, never letting go of what needs to be accomplished, never losing sight of deadlines, but knowing that most work and your work likely is interdependent. You rely on others to get their work done so that you can get your work done. It makes sense to treat these people well because there are all kinds of great outcomes from treating others well. And we're gonna to get to that in just a little bit, but one of those is what I just referred to a minute ago. I felt better every time I left the office of those leaders that asked about me, that showed they cared about me. And that allowed me to think more clearly and get back to work more uh, effectively than those bosses I had that would subtly judge me or criticize me. Uh, I had an academic unit head or department chair is another way to say it, who would grade me at the highest scores for teaching, scholarship, and service. But at our annual review face-to-face, -face, she would spend probably 90% of our time together talking about the one student who had a negative thing to say about me. That is managing by, managing by exception. That felt poor. Um, she was also just a very judgmental, critical person. And it would take me days to be able to think more clearly. I'd go home and tell my wife all about it. I would, it, would, I would, it would affect my sleep. And what I'm suggesting is how you treat people not only affects their well-being and their productivity and their ability to get their work done effectively, but also yours. So I'm going to share with you a technique that will help you nurture these relationships, nurture this people side so that work can get done more effectively. And so using the chat box, I have a blank here. And I'm going to put, pull the chat box up. Oh, I have it up. Yes. Um, one of the more popular leadership books in the world, in its sixth, maybe it's the seventh edition. I have the, um, the visual here of the sixth edition, is by Kuzis and Posner. They're two academics in California, I believe. And uh, they have had a 40-year or so 
uh, data collection going with leaders around the world. And they have put this into the form of books and programs and workshops and, and certifications and all sorts of things. I even, I'm even considering getting certified as a leadership challenge uh, trainer. Um, it's, it's to me that good. And uh, they have uh, a variety of uh, principles that they've that are evidence based from the data that they've come up with. But they're in essence, they say that leadership is a blank. And based on everything that I've said so far, what would you guess the blank word, it's one word, would be? So take, take a chance, if you would, and put in the chat box, type into the chat box how you would fill out this sentence. Leadership is a... And I'm gonna, I'm gonna watch the chat box. So I have a giant screen in front of me. It's a 32 inch screen. So um, I hope you don't mind if my eyes get diverted to the slides over here and the chat box over here and so on. So leadership is definitely a challenge. Yes. Leadership is influence. Leadership is an opportunity. Leadership is quality. Okay, keep going. And anybody who's answered already could answer a second time if you'd like. Nobody has hit upon Kuzis and Posner's keyword yet. Leadership is definitely a process, Pooja. And let me tell you that, uh, and Orna, um, leadership is a challenge. One of their five principles is leaders challenge the process. Leaders challenge the process. Leaders also model the way. So they're great role models. They have great character. Others want to follow them. Leaders inspire a shared vision. So you think about some of the most visionary people in your country, in China, in the US, and other places around the world. Richard Branson with the, the, uh, the Virgin um, brand, uh, with um, uh, in our country, the United States, Apple, um, is the highest capitalized firm in the world, the visionary that Steve Jobs was, uh, and so on. And art, a selfless act, a skill, a drive, a sacrifice. Nobody's hit it yet. The other two, so these will maybe trigger the correct word, or not, I don't want to say the correct word, Kuzis and Posner's word for the basis of their whole book is the other two principles beyond model the way, inspire a shared vision, challenge the process, are en enable others to act. So as people are ready, give them more autonomy to make their own decisions and have them be willing to fail. Let them fail as a learning experience. And then the last is to encourage the heart, to encourage the heart, recognize people for good work done, celebrate accomplishments, have individual celebrations, recognitions, and group celebrations and recognitions. Encourage the heart. And it's those two that, that get most close to what I'm suggesting here, what Kuzis and Bosner suggest. And no one yet, and my, my MBA program struggles with this too, uh, and I don't want to say you're struggling with it. It is, leadership is a, and I've said it many times already, a relationship. Leadership is a relationship. Leadership is also, for some, a vision. But it's also, it's not just task accomplishment and challenging process and inspiring a shared vision. It's also the relationship you develop with others. Because, again, let's face it, work, most work is interdependent. Why do, why do universities have so many people working for them? Why do organizations, big, big organizations like uh, Tata um, um, have so many people working for them? They need people to get the work done. And how do you get people to work, get the work done? In part, you have to create, create conditions that are motivating and positive and fair and rewarding. You have to treat people well. What's one way to treat people well? Get to know them, know what makes them tick, put them in the right role so they can succeed. So leadership is a relationship and that's the basis for a big part of this book. In other words, P 
People in leadership roles who develop strong relationships with their people, with their coworkers, and from all angles, from uh, their book with their boss and bosses, if they have multiple bosses, to their uh, people at the same level, other leaders, and to their subordinates, if they develop strong bonds, they are more likely to be viewed as leaders. So that's a big premise for my talk uh, today. And it doesn't, you don't have to be a leader to benefit from this, of course. So using the chat box, and I see that uh, Arpita uh, added uh, a teamwork, finish a task with everyone's good skill. Indeed, that's what is what I'm referring to as the importance of interdependence. So um, how would an, oh, I'm sorry, how would an idea boss, let me, uh, that, that should say, how would an ideal boss behave? So I'll put it in the chat box. box. How would an ideal boss behave? So um, this could be a boss you currently have, a boss you previously had, or um, just in your mind's eye, what would an ideal boss do? How would an ideal boss behave? Could you just go ahead and humor me for a minute? And everyone, we have, uh, we have 38 people in the room. Uh, somehow we lost a bunch. We had 40, 48 or, or a little while ago. Um, 38 people in the room. Could we have maybe at least 30 of, 30 of you comment, how would an ideal boss behave? What kind of things would they do um, to have you judge them as ideal? I'm watching the chat box. Humanely, yes, Abhishek. Yes. Ah, with caring and empathy, Swapan. Yes, treat everyone equally. And may I add fairly, uh, friendly. They're friendly, they're confident and patient. Provide positive vibes. They're focused in work and in understanding. So that's that nice juxtaposition between uh, that balance between task and people focused on the work, but also on understanding. And maybe maybe the understanding in this case, uh, sut sut Sutapa, uh, might be uh, comprehending as well. So that might be more task oriented, but absolutely they're motivating or they create conditions that are motivating. Yeah. Anybody else? Okay. So, so, so many ideal boss would be sensitive to social injustices as they play out in the workroom, anti-racist, anti-sexist, anti-caste, and they would work to limit those negative influences in the office. There is a cultural sensitivity that absolutely has to be in play for a leader to be viewed as optimal, absolutely. They're supportive and take suggestions from the team. They should be encouraging and supportive, encouraging. Again, um, would have, uh, let's see, ensure the work gets done properly. I would focus on the best efforts, encourage work and be open, not bully, be fair, understand personal problems and capacities, absolutely. And you can see now that nearly every one of those comments are about interactions with people. And so to be encouraging, to be motivating, to have positive vibes, to create positive vibes, to be patient, to be friendly, to treat everyone equally, to be caring and empathetic and humane, it takes effort. It takes intentionality. It takes caring. It takes tuning in to others. And that's a lot of what we're talking about. So I'm going to move on, but thank you so much for the great uh, participation so far. So why is this important? Well, let's go to a couple of theories very quickly. One of the more established leadership theories is leader member exchange theory, also known as LMX, the acronym LMX. And this theory has been widely used and widely studied uh, empirically as well, and has found that no surprise that People in positions of leadership have dyadic relationships um, and create, uh, sometimes unwittingly, they have create in-groups 
people that are similar to them, who have similar interests and who they like, and outgroups, people who are not so similar, who don't have such similar interests and who they don't like. And I'm simplifying it and it's much too simple. But what I'm suggesting here and what leader member exchange theory suggests is the strong, when, when a relationship is strong with coworkers, great things occur. And you can see some of these outcomes, the quality of the relationship impacts worker motivation and commitment. I mean, if you've had a bad boss in the past who you didn't like and who didn't like you or didn't value you, were you motivated to work for them? Were you committed to work for them? Uh, how was your work satisfaction? Uh, were you distracted by this bad boss? And I've had one recently who was horrible. The one that I referred to earlier that was judgmental and critical. And she was constantly uh, focused on the one or two things that were going wrong and not on the hundred things that were going well. And I, I thought about leaving the university because I couldn't stand working for her. And I wasn't alone. This was a common refrain from other, uh, my other, excuse me, my other coworkers. Um, a good boss, good relationships matter to these things. And so taking time to develop relationships more strongly, even with your least preferred coworker, this gets to uh, Fiedler's uh, theory on leadership. Your, your, your leadership effectiveness is in part based, based on what Fiedler said, is in part based on your the strength of the relationship with your least favorite coworker, the one you least like. So if you can be have a pretty good relationship with your least favorite coworker and better relationship with everybody else, you're probably going to be perceived as a good leader. So it makes sense to spend time with all of your people, get to know them, care about them. This is hard work. This is extra work but it's gonna pay off in having them be more productive. You'll have less turnover. You'll have to do a lot less hiring because people aren't leaving you and it's going to cause you a lot less hassle. So that's leader member exchange theory and Fiedler. Secondly, transformational leadership theory. Maybe some of you know about this, but people who have these attributes tend to be viewed as leaders who can transform a workplace. Not every workplace needs to be transformed, but where workplaces are under turmoil and need to have change. And my university has had a little bit of that, not a whole lot, it's been pretty steady, but we've had a bit of change, mostly at the college level, not at the university level. It's been a pretty stable place with very high demand from parents and students. So that's good, all good. But a lot of workplaces need major change. And that calls for a certain type of leader, a leader who has, who's a great role model, who has, who is kind of an ideal role model and can influence the, in that way. Here's where I'm kind of focused on the second one, individualized consideration, a leader who spends time with their direct reports and gets to know them and cares about them deeply, not just the work person, but also the whole person the person outside of work, their families and so on, getting to know the whole person and knows what they would take, because let's face it, um, some of you have family situations that are affecting your work. When things are good at home, work is easier to do. When things are struggling in your personal life, work is hard to do and vice versa. What your work, affects how things are at home and in your personal life. So if you can have at least a boss who cares about the whole person and knows about you and can support you, not just at work, but also perhaps in just uh, being a sounding board for you, for your problems outside of work, a little bit, you don't have to play the role of psychotherapist or counselor, but just a little bit, that will pay huge dividends. And transformational leadership backs this up. Um, obviously, to be inspirational, like I talked about earlier with the leadership challenge, inspiring a shared vision is really critically important to have a vision for a more attractive future is part of being a transformation or, or any leader, but a transformational leader, especially, and being intellectually stimulating, you don't, who would want to work for a boss who's incompetent, who's not intellectually stimulating, who doesn't um, challenge us to think. And so when a, when a person in a position of leadership has these four attributes, 
performance goes beyond expectations. Great things happen. So that's leadership. Um, that's some leadership theory. I'm going to move more quickly now because I want to get to our exercises and I want, I'm looking at the time. We're already at an hour and we need to take our first break. We're going to take just one break and about a five minute break. Um, the second is well-being's at stake. And here's a well-being model by the uh, global firm Gallup who has done about 50 years or so of surveys on a variety of issues, but two that I'm tuned into that they do on a regular basis with millions of people are well-being and engagement. So here's one well-being model that Gallup says, basically your well-being is high if all five of these things are clicking. If you're physically doing well, and I know maybe a few people in the room have COVID right now, and so your, your well-being is not very good right now, but when your physical well-being is good, when uh, things in your community feel stable and you like things at home, you like your friends and so on, uh, you're actively involved, that helps your well-being. Financially, if you're not worried about money and paying your bills, your well-being is higher. If you are worried, your well-being is lower, obviously. And then the two that I'm focused on here for this talk are career and social. Uh, you like what you do, and you have meaningful relationships in your life. And that gets to family as well. Um, so the focus here is on work and on coaching in the workplace and on leadership. And so those two things, um, we're, I'm talking with you for, as a worker to other workers right now in this Zoom session. Um, if your career is going pretty well and it's a good fit for you and you like most of your work, not all of it perhaps, but most of your work, your well-being has spiked. Your well-being is a little higher. And if your social relationships are strong, um, your well-being is higher. And so put those two together. When we have great relationships in our work, we work more productively and we're more satisfied in our work. So that's well-being model number one. Uh, well-being model number two is Martin Seligman, the former president of the American Psychological Association. And if you've ever heard the term learned helplessness or learned optimism, he was the force behind studying those, um, those terms. Um, he had a well-being model that he put out in 2012 in the book Flourish um, that had these five components. And just think about it for yourself in just a second. Um, my work. Um, do I have a sense of accomplishment in my work? I'm using my cursor to point to a few things. Do I have a sense of accomplishment in my work? Um, do people recognize me for my accomplishments in my work? If so, my well being is probably a little higher. Is some of my work, maybe most of my work, meaningful? Is it meaningful to me? Does it fulfill some purpose for me in my life? If so, higher well being. Am I engaged in my work? Do I sometimes get so lost in my work that hours go by because I'm so immersed in it? Well, you probably have pretty high engagement. And this also gets to social engagement as well. Do I like who I'm working with, especially since work is so interdependent typically? Um, do, are the relationships strong? And how do I feel about my work? Now, all, of, all four of these things, accomplishment, meaning, engagement, relationships, all fuel positive emotions as well. When these four things are going well, I, we feel better. Leadership influences all of these things. So that's the second well-being model. Well-being also in, in, impacts engagement. I should say leadership also impacts engagement. So are workers engaged uh, with their work? Are they in the right seats on the bus is, is what um, um, Jim Collins talks about in um, some of his books in leadership. Uh, do you, have you put the right people in the right roles, in other words, are they, are they in the right seats on the bus, are they in the right work roles? And do they have the capacity to do the work well? Then you have, you have got a greater chance of a person feeling engaged in their work and, and producing. So there are very significant differences in engaged versus disengaged workers on all of these outcomes. Engaged workers are more productive. They have less absenteeism. They, have, they don't turn over as much. In other words, they don't leave organizations as much. They put out quiet, higher quality work. Uh, they're more creative um, when they're engaged. Uh, their well-being is higher and they do more for the organization outside of their job description. In other words, 
citizenship behaviors. Um, how to get people engaged? Well, you got to get to know them. You got to get to care about them. You got to get to know what makes them tick so you can put them in those tasks and roles and teams to help them be more engaged rather than less engaged. So a question would be, what would workers be more engaged with their work if they knew their boss and coworkers cared deeply about them? Would workers be more engaged with their work if they knew their boss and coworkers care deeply about them? It's a rhetorical question. You don't have to put it in the chat box. The answer is obviously yes. It's yes. If a boss and coworkers care about me, I'm more likely to be happy at work. I'm more likely to um, be not distracted by bad relationships. I can get to work. I'm out of the fight, flight, freeze, amygdala hijack mode and into the prefrontal cortex where I can actually get my work done. So what are primary reasons workers leave voluntarily? So I'm gonna give you 30 seconds to just think about it. What are the primary reasons why workers leave jobs voluntarily? They, they were producing at a high level. They're not in, they're not, they have no fear of being fired. What are the primary reasons why um, workers leave jobs voluntarily? You can put it in the chat box if you'd like, or, or if anybody wants to speak out, go ahead. Stress, yeah. Work pressure, absolutely. What else? No satisfaction from the work, absolutely. Maybe these are these are from people who have had have felt some of these things. For a spike in salary, not a good work environment. No recognition. So you can see that some of these are intrinsic feelings and also relate very strongly to what I've been talking about, the, the, the quality of the relationships at work. Um, if you have a great boss, the, the great boss is gonna recognize you. Um, they're gonna create a better work environment. Um, they're gonna put you in the right role so you can have greater satisfaction in your work. They're gonna recognize that you're under a lot of pressure and look for ways to relieve some of that pressure. Um, they're gonna be less negative or they're gonna try to create conditions that are more positive in the workplace. Um, unsatisfactory ambiance and so on, relationship um, and so on. So now I'm gonna reveal what a lot of surveys say. I didn't do a comprehensive exhaustive, but I looked at a, quite a few surveys about why workers leave voluntarily. And what's gonna be very interesting is it's gonna mimic a lot of what you typed. And um, Abhishek says, feeling unheard, unacknowledged, absolutely. And this gets to relationships again, the quality of relationships, do people care about me? And that sort of thing. What's interesting is a couple people said money. Money is not typically one of the top five reasons why people leave. That's not to say that some people don't leave for more money, but what surveys say, and again, survey after survey after survey that I looked at, didn't put compensation as one of the top five reasons why people leave. The number one reason why people leave, not in every survey, but in many surveys, is their relationships with their boss, primarily, and or their coworkers. And relatedly, recognition, appreciation, and positive feedback if they're not getting that from their boss and coworkers, they're not going to feel very good about their work and they'll start thinking about leaving. And then, of course, some of these other things are really understanding what, a per what makes a person pit tick, what they're capable of and putting them in the right role so they can succeed and not be bored and unchallenged and to have more meaningful work. And a boss who, who provides greater recognition or, or when the boss recognizes that a worker is ready to take on more work, they can then turn over more work to them and give people more autonomy, the autonomy that most of you and I crave. I want more autonomy, not, not less. I don't want a boss looking over my shoulder or coworkers looking over my shoulder and critiquing my work. I wanna be trusted for getting work done on my own so that when I present it to others who are depending on that work, they believe that I've done it well. Um, so it's interesting, coaching can help all of these and leaders should address every one of these things. 
And it's just interesting that compensation and benefits are not in the top five. So what are some premises for building relationships at work? Well, supportive colleagues make for a more collaborative work atmosphere. Secondly, attending to relationships, especially with authentic caring, provides us with positive hormonal fuel. It makes us feel better. It gives us, it's a mood stabilizer when we have better relationships. It helps our well-being and our happiness. We get more serotonin up, up, uptick. We get more dopamine. It feels better. It's pleasurable to have better relationships. We have more oxytocin, so we feel more bonded. And some studies will say even that it helps relax us to have better relationships. So attending to relationships and having better relationships makes us feel better. And thirdly, coaching coworkers helps improve. And this gets not just to leaders, but just uh, tuning into other coworkers, even if you're not in a leadership role, can help relationship bonds with many positive outcomes. And here's the evidence from two meta-analyses. Um, I've talked with Rebecca Jones in the UK and also, let's see, oh, he's not in one of these, but another guy in Israel um, via Zoom a few times. Um, they do extensive research. And here are a couple of uh, meta-analyses that show that actually coaching has these kinds of outcomes. Um, and one I wanna highlight is increased perceptions of caring leadership, which helps people get back to work, not be distracted by a bad boss or a boss that doesn't care very much about me. The perception, if the perception is high, I can get back to work and be more productive and I'll be more satisfied with my work. So great outcomes come from building relationships at work. So I wanna check in with um, the folks who are running this um, and see uh, how we're doing on time. Can we take a, a five minute break and then can we have about a half an hour more or would that put us much too much over time? Dr. Saha um, and yes, others. And, uh, we can, all, all of this, uh, Bob, is Ishika here? No. Yes. Yes. Can we go till um, uh, 30 more minutes? Yeah, sure. That's not a problem. And I is don't that a think that it's, it's not a problem, in fact. Okay. And I don't think that we need five minute break because, yeah, otherwise, that uh, the tribe which you have created. I might be lost, you know, that we are just pulling towards a tribe, what you have created, the environment, the environment. Okay, you can okay. carry on, okay? So just carry okay. on, no, no break? No, no. Okay, here we go. All right, and uh, obviously we're in Zoom, so if you need to go to the, 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 uh, the toilet, uh, feel free, um, and then come <laughs> right back. Um, and uh, keep your sound on so you can hear while you're, while you're using, taking the break. <laughs> All right, third. So what is coaching? Why coach others and what are the practices of effective coaching? So now we're getting, we're getting close to where we're going to practice. All right, first, what is coaching? Coaching is, I'm going to give you a couple of definitions, one that I've created in a minute, and then this one from the International Coach Federation. This is the, the coaching body and under which I'm getting certified, it's probably the largest in the world. And they suggest that coaching is partnering with clients or coworkers, really anyone. Um, there's a lot of coaching that's life coaching for coaching uh, just uh, people at home, people who aren't working too, um, in a thought provoking and creative process that inspires that person to change, basically, to maximize their personal and professional potential. So the goal here, as uh, one of the pioneers in coaching said, John, Sir John Whitmore, it, uh, coaching helps unlock a person's potential to maximize their own performance. So this is a person um, often doesn't know what their potential is. And through the help of a caring other person who asks great questions, probing questions, the, the layers of the onion get peeled back and peeled back and peeled back. And finally, we have aha moments where awareness is um, improved so that we can actually act on the things that are most bothersome to us or act on our greatest aspirations, which maybe weren't even clear to us until we were being coached. 
And that's the magic of coaching. Of course, it's not magic, but it feels magical when a person works with us and cares so deeply about us such that we then have these revelatory moments, these aha moments. He also adds, it is helping them to learn rather than teaching them. So the old cliche that it's less effective to hand a person a fish than it is to teach them how to fish so that they can fish on their own. In the same way, <clears throat> if, you're, if you're a boss and you're constantly solving your workers' problems for them, they'll keep coming back to you and you'll always be really busy. Not really effective for helping create capacity in your coworkers. It would be better to help them learn how to solve their own problems so that you can spend more time on perhaps strategic issues or on the things that you need to spend time on and not having workers come to you so often. Second, coaching is, and this is where one I've aggregated the different literatures and created this definition, it's relationship oriented. So we've made, I think I've made that clear so far. It's coachy centered, and I'll get to that in a little bit. It's not all about the coach. It's not about the coach coming up with great solutions. Hey, I'm a hero, I'll solve your problem for you. No, it's focused on the coach ye, the person being coached with great listening and great questions and holding the coachy accountable for the goals that they said they want to achieve. It's goal driven. So it's not just having a great conversation, it's closing the gap between where the person is and where they say they wanna be and helping support them in closing that gap. It's non-prescriptive, so the coach doesn't solve their problems. They might suggest some alternatives, but hold that back until the person has sort of exhausted their own solutions. It's action-oriented because again, we're, the coachee wants to solve a problem, they're gonna to need to take action to solve the problem. And accountability-reliant, and it's this intervention by accountability reliant. What I mean by that is the coach uh, helps the coachee, the person being coached, set goals and then follows up with the person. How are you doing on that goal? You say you want to um, work in advance and not pre or procrastinate and wait till the end. How are you doing with working in advance on certain tasks? How are you doing on working with that subordinate who you don't have a very good relationship with? Have you talked with them yet? Have you met with them face to face? What have you asked them? A lot of questions, holding them accountable for the things they say are important for them to do, the goals that they set. It helps the client fill the gap between their current and their future, their desire. So that's that. So why coach your workers? Because of all these great outcomes we talked about. You'll increase the work relationship bond. You'll increase the climate. The climate will be better. There'll be more positive emotions getting back to um, uh, Saran's comment about negativity in the workplace. Uh, flipping that into positive because you're now caring about your coworkers more. Um, so so Sutapa said, not a good work environment. It's gonna help with that climate, that work environment, increase trust, engagement, and uh, transparency and vulnerability. As people start to unpeel the onion and willing to share their deepest uh, desires and their fears and their um, failures and their, um, their anxieties, only then can the leader really help them alleviate some of those things. Until we know what our coworkers and our subordinates are thinking and feeling, only then can we help them do better, feel better, be more productive, be more satisfied. So um, coaching workers also decreases the belief that leadership only cares about getting work done. So I get to the task versus people graphic as well. Um, too many leaders focus only on getting tasks done and truly don't care much about their people. And so coaching builds more of that balance that we talked about, uncovers hidden issues, fears, aspirations, misalignments, which I just talked about, and increases your leadership effectiveness. So what we're going to focus on in an article, um, and there are many, many articles in HBR, Harvard Business 
uh, review.org, which I subscribe to and I have my MBA students subscribe to. There are just a, a million great evidence-based articles in there. Some are very short, some are much longer. They are, it's just so fantastic. And coaching is one of their emphases now. And one of the articles that I really like was this called Leadership as Coach. And they talk about coaching others typically involves five steps, assessing the situation, listening effectively, asking open-ended powerful questions and practicing non-directive coaching. Non-directive coaching means not solving their problem for them. Uh, creating conditions for the person to talk, to solve their own problems, and then helping with goal setting, commitment setting, and accountability. Our focus today at our practice session will simply be to learn how to listen more effectively, ask better questions, and to practice uh, this non-directive coaching. And that'll make sense in just a bit, bit. So very quickly, I'm gonna talk about the hierarchy of coaching and, and talk about how important it is to uh, be at level three. Then I'll talk about some powerful questions and then we're gonna practice. And we're gonna finish with the practice and just talk a little bit about it. All right, so first level one is self-focused listening. And that is, I'm, I'm sort of listening, I'm looking at the person, but I've got my own movie playing. I'm thinking about whatever they're saying, but I'm also thinking, well, I had an experience like that, or I can solve this problem. Why haven't they solved that? Why haven't they solved the problem yet? Um, I, uh, I, got, I got things to do. Boy, I hope this person stops talking. I really need to move on to my next thing. Um, that's self-focused listening. And obviously that's not very effective and it's not relationship building. The second level is problem solving listening. That's potentially helpful, but it's not very empowered. I'm listening to the person speaking. I'm hearing their problem. And the whole time I'm listening to their problem, I'm thinking of solutions. And I can't wait for their, them to stop talking so that I can solve their problems for them and be the hero that they need me to be to solve their problem. Again, not very relationship building, better than level one, but not as empowering as level three. Level three is very focused on not only the words that they're saying, what the person is saying, the coachee is saying, but also on their facial expressions, their gestures, the tone of their voice, an energy shift. Oh my goodness, you just, you just seem very excited about talking about doing this task. What's that about? And really paying attention to those kinds of things. So level one, appears to be listening, but attention wavers. Level two gets the general gist of what a person's saying, but misses the nonverbals, isn't really tuning in to anything but the words. And unfortunately, they're distracted by their own thoughts. Level two is, hey, I'm tuned in, I'm listening. This is what the person's thinking. I'm listening and, oh, I understand the problem. Oh, I can solve that. I've got experiences that, that will help them problem solve that. What's the problem with this? Well, it's, it's disempowering. It's, it's handing the person the fish, not teaching them to fish. Level three, so it's disempowering. And do you want them to come to you every time they have a problem? No, that'll distract you from your work. And it's causing them to be reliant on you, dependent on you. That's not very effective. Level three is much more effective. It's empathetic, as mentioned earlier, laser focused on the person. They pay close attention to both their words and their nonverbals their tone, their energy, their body language, their facial expressions, and so on. They push aside distracting thoughts. This is hard. This is really hard. Not easy to do, but if you do it well, it's incredibly empowering. I'm, I'm coaching a, a middle-level manager of an insurance company right now, um, an executive director of a nonprofit, uh, a small business owner, uh, another one who wants to start a small business, a um, and a uh, entrepreneur who just started a new uh, IT uh, security business. And um, each of them have keep, kept coming back to me time after time again. And it always amazes me that they want to call me because I don't call them for appointments. I say, if you want to see me or hit listen or hear or talk with me, email me or, or call me. And it always amazes me when they continually come back. I guess I've learned the technique of supporting them of caring about them, of helping them unpeel the layers so that they can solve these problems. It's really powerful and it feels great to the coach too. It'll feel great to you as a coworker or a leader, person in a position of leadership. 
Um, the, another thing that I haven't talked about is be hyper-focused on dancing in the moment. That is, you know, in dancing, if you're dancing with another person, usually there's one person who leads and the other person who follows the lead. I'm going to suggest that while the coach understands the coaching process of listening deeply and asking per certain kinds of questions, which I'll talk about in a minute, it's important to let them lead the dance. Let them lead the dance because it's their movie. It's their problems that, want to, that they want to, to have solved. So let them lead, but you will nudge them certain ways uh, by asking great questions and allow the, the client to dominate the conversation. Do a lot less of the talking and let them do most of the talking. The 80-20 principle is let the client or let the coworker who's being coached do at least 80% of the talking and use silent, silent patience. So let 20 seconds go by. If the person just finished their comment but you sense that there's more, let 15, 20, 25 seconds goes by, which will feel very painful and not easy to do at all. But it's amazing that often the person is actually thinking. They're not ready for, to listen to you because when you talk or ask another question, you're gonna distract them from what they're thinking potentially. So there's a, there's a, a skill in, in knowing when to, to ask a question or talk and when to be silent and it's, it's a, it's a learned skill, it's not an easy thing, but, but just know that that's one of the skills that as you become more skilled at coaching, it'll be something that it's a tool in your toolkit. In other words, uh, one of the articles uh, called what gets, away in the, uh, what gets in the Way of Listening in uh, HBR.org is says you must focus on the deeper internal issues at stake to really improve your listening. Um, and here's another thing that many of you may have seen is that um, it's from the elements of personal communication. Communication, um, occurs not, not just verbally, but also non-verbally. Um, and what one of the more famous models of communication by Dr. Albert, and I don't know how to say his last name, Moravian perhaps, um, is the 738-55 rule. And it's taught throughout communication schools and programs throughout the world is that a small part of our communication is actually our spoken words a much larger part is the unspoken, the, the way in which I say this. So if I say to you, I love you, versus I love you, I love you. Those evoke, those are the same words, but they evoke a different message in each case. And so tone matters, emphasis matters, and, and facial expressions matter. If I say, I love you with this face versus, I love you. Those convey a very different message. So understanding that, that in your coaching of others, in your relationship building with others, to pay attention to the whole person and the, all the ways that they're conveying, communicating with you, not just with their words, is super important. Uh, listening is really hard. Our listening brain is wired to do exactly what this level three discourages um, our listening brain typically, and, we, and we're all problem solvers. We've learned part of what makes us productive and has gotten us into the position we're in is we've become great at problem solving, but that's not what we should be doing as coaches. We can ask questions that help people solve their own problems. And so it, in a sense, helps with problem solving, but we don't wanna hand them the fish. We wanna teach them how to fish. So. Our listening brain is wired to do exactly what active three, active level three listening discourages. Evaluate, predict, make judgments, perform triage, and all those things. That mode of functioning, according to recent thinking in cognitive neuroscience, which is a really hot field that some of you may be in, evolved as the brain strategy to use its finite neural capacity efficiency. So that's what evolved, our problem solving, our evaluative capacities, our ability to predict, our ability to make judgments and to solve problems. Um, the challenge in coaching, the challenge in building relationships is to actively empathically listen. And this requires no less than a willful override of the brain's preferred mode. <laughs> Isn't that just crazy? So it is hard work. Listening is hard work. It's worth doing though, since listening creates optimal conditions for communicating. In two other articles in the hbr.org, listening to employees talk about their own experiences first can make giving them feedback, even if it's hard feedback, more productive 
by helping create an environment that's psychologically safe where they can be more receptive to the hard feedback and less defensive. And similarly, listening is an overlooked tool that creates an environment of safety when done well. So here's our next Zoom poll and then we'll get to the practice. All right, let me stop the share. I guess I still had that on the screen. Sorry about that. Let's go to polling two. Here's our second poll. My family members would describe my willingness to listen in this way. And there are five questions here, I believe. So let's try to get everybody to participate if we can. Did I launch it yet? You can't see it. Would no, it the poll is visible. Oh, now it is, now it is, now it is. Ah, that's good, thanks. I forgot to launch it, sorry. My camera hit it. So my family members describe my, listen, my willingness to listen in this way. So pick one for each of these. I'm asking you to just pick one. We're up to 31%. Almost 50%. Okay, we're still going. All right, I'm gonna stop the poll. It's well over 60% now. I'm gonna share the results with you. All right, for the seven people who are great listeners already, thank you for coming today. You're welcome to leave. Just kidding. Well, you are welcome to leave if you need to, but if you're already a great listener, perhaps you don't need this, but you know what? Stick around because you'll need to learn the powerful questions part. Uh, it's interesting that you, as you can see on the screen, that um, some of you are terrible listeners, or one person says, I'm a terrible listener. Um, often, uh, a handful say they're often distracted by their listening. Um, they're, some are pretty good, and a handful, 33% uh, in the first question, 19 in the second question, say they're great listeners. Um, of course, listening is probably best judged by others, and so I'm asking you to respond uh, about yourself. Uh, number three, when another person is speaking, I'm often distracted by my own thoughts. Um, 10 plus 57 is 67% are often distracted by their own thoughts. And 57% and, and, uh, and number four say, it's very true. My listening often depends on who, am I speak, who I'm speaking with and add another 19%. So the majority suggests that listening varies depending on who you're speaking with. And lastly, often my listening depends on how much pressure I'm feeling. And so we're often under a lot of pressure. We're often under a lot of deadlines. So my guess is listening is sub-optimized most of the time for most of us, either a function of we're just not good listeners yet or and or the combination of work pressures. So I would suggest that most of us need this. So I'm gonna stop the, that and we're now going to talk about uh, very, very briefly and then get to our exercise because oh, the time is flowing and it's, um, I'm talking too much. So level three listening uh, is thought provoking open-ended questions, client centered questions. These are more empowering. These are more problem capacity building. This is teaching to fish, not handing a fish, unlike levels one and two, which are questions like level one, would you like to hear a similar experience I had? Now that you're forcing the coachee, the person who's beginning coach, to listen to you about your stories. You may want to tell a story like that, but hold it back a little bit 
wait, wait until more layers have been unpeeled from the onion. Wait until they've come up with some alternative solutions before you share your experiences, before you share your solutions. Let me tell you what I do. No, no, you're, you're handing them a fish, right? And they may not even agree with you. Probably not good coaching, not good leadership. Let's go in a different direction. Consider this. Again, you're forcing the person to now pivot to listening to you and you're not coaching them anymore. Level two, solution focused. Have you thought about when, what about talking about your with your boss about this? Here's something you haven't mentioned. What do you think? All of those are solutions and they might be great, but it would be better if the person that you're coaching came up with them on his or her own. Level three are thought provoking, open-ended, more empowering, client-centered. These are focused, these are typically what and how questions and not why questions. So why not why? Well, if I ask you, why haven't you thought about X or why don't you do Y, that will probably make you feel either defensive or dumb. Like, yeah, why didn't I think about that? Hmm. You don't want a, a person to feel defensive or dumb or make them feel dumb. So avoid the why question wherever you can. What and how questions are open-ended. They are non-judgmental, typically, if they're crafted well. And I'll show you some of those in a minute. What do you think is really going on? What else comes to mind? That, that's, that evokes the desire for a person to um, ask more questions or, or, to add, or to come up with solutions on their own, alternative solutions on their own. How might you go about doing that? What are some obstacles to accomplishing this goal? If fear, here's a really good one. If fear was absent, what would you do? If you're one of these people who wants to start a side business, but you haven't yet done it, what do you fear? What's stopping you? What might cause you to have this side business? And so those, what I want you to focus on here are what and how questions. So this up here. And, so the goals for this activity that we're gonna to get to in a second, and we're probably just gonna now spend maybe five minutes um, coaching each other's and come back in the big room, talk about it briefly and then uh, reverse switch roles. Goals for this activity to enhance your listening and asking skills, boost your belief in your coaching ability, stimulate your desire to apply coaching in all relationships, experiment with expressing more vulnerability and that would be primarily in the role of coachee when you're actually being coached and create a stronger, more transparent bond. And of course, that's in the role of coach. So um, here are the three big to do's when coaching. And we're not going to do this third one today. We're not going to prompt action, but are to listen deeply, that level three listening, to ask what or how questions, don't steer the conversation, ask powerful questions, those two things today. So what I want you to focus on as you coach um, and you, again, you're going to play the role of coach and then you're going to play the role of coachee as you coach is to listen to the entire person who's speaking with you, their body language, their tone, and so on, and ask what or how questions. So here is, I need to put this in the chat box as well. Um, here is a possible first question and we're going to go to breakout rooms and, um, I will, let's see. I will need the ability to do breakout rooms. I'm not seeing that on my screen. So uh, would one of the co-facilitators um, set up um, fifth, let's see, 16 breakout rooms? Um, let's see, I'm not seeing that on my screen, the ability to set breakout rooms. Um, so, coachee, if you're going to play the role of coachee when you get into your breakout room, and when you get to your breakout room, what I'd like you to do is decide with the other person in the breakout room if you're playing the role of coach or coachee, okay? And you're going to switch later, but uh, just decide that one of you will play the role of coach and the other will be coachee. And the coachee will tell the coach, uh, maybe one of these questions or another question that you have, but here are some examples of questions. And probably it'd be good to start with one of these questions. If it was 10 years from now and you loved what you were doing, what would it be and what would it feel like? So the, 
once the coach knows the question to ask, the coach asks that question. I know this feels a little complicated. Um, ask the question of the coachee. The coachee will decide on what the question, the starting question is, and the coach will ask it. Here's another one. What is the one habit you'd most likely uh, to adopt or eliminate? What's one goal you're struggling to accomplish? Or a more general question, what's the most valuable topic you'd like to discuss? So actually what I'll do is I will go into a room as well, and I'm gonna stop the share so that I can, um, so that I can put this in the chat box so that everybody can see it. And so pull up your chat box, if you will. If you're not familiar with Zoom, it might be in the more section. So here are those same questions. So at the bottom of your screen, if you don't have the chat box up um, under more, it probably will show chat and then you can go ahead and um, see what I've just copied and pasted into the chat box. Um, I do not have the capability to put uh, you in breakout rooms. So the, um, one of the co-facilitators, uh, would you speak with me right now and let me know that you can set up the breakout rooms? Sir, exactly. Uh, Excuse me, sir. Yes. I, we don't have the uh, facility room, sir. You do not yes. have the cap capability? Yes, Bob. Sorry for the interruption. We don't have uh, the breakout room in our Zoom uh, platform. Ah, OK. So that's why you can't see it. We are apologetic for this, but uh, we are really happy. All right. So we're going to do this a little bit differently. We're just, I'm going to coach someone, OK? I'm going to coach someone and um, we won't reverse roles then. And given the time, it's probably a good idea anyway. Um, who is willing to be coached for, let's say, five minutes based on one of these questions? Who is willing to be coached? I'm willing. Uh, Mani uh, okay. Now, two people, uh, Manisha said yes and Pamani said yes as well. Um, I can only do one at a time. Um, so, uh, Padmini, um, I'm going to coach you. If I'm sorry, Manisha, but uh, Padmini also responded verbally. So I'm hope, hoping that's okay, Manisha, that I go ahead and uh, coach Padmini. Um, I'm going to go ahead and yeah, start the. Yeah, uh, I'm going to go ahead and start the um, share as uh, as again. And Padmini, uh, do you mind putting your video on? Yeah, I'll put it. Okay, um, so that I can see you. Okay, one sec. Yeah. All right. Okay. Uh, a, uh, yeah. All right. Very good, Padmini. Well, uh, thank you for being willing uh, to be vulnerable and, and share something that you'd like to work on. So, um, based on the screen and the chat box, these questions, do one of these, would you like me to ask you one of these questions and then we'll have a dialogue? Yeah, okay. Which one? Which one is? Oh, uh, which one? Yeah. Uh, so is there well, a, you can ask me the very first one. The very first one. Yes. All right, so let's go ahead and get started yeah, then. Yeah. yeah. Okay, I'm gonna uh, ask you this. Yeah. All right, you so- said it, 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 for 10 years, how, uh, what is love doing? Yes, okay, so I'm gonna ask you that question and then you go ahead and respond. So Padmini, if, if it was 10 years from now and you absolutely loved what you were doing, what would it be and what would it feel like? Well, I have been. I love doing a lot of research all over, um, even in tribal regions and even in various countries. And that, uh, and then I like to share that with my students. When I come back, I make presentations and share that. I love doing that. 
So what is the gap between where, what you're doing now and what you would love to be doing 10 years from now? Or is there a gap? Well, the gap is uh, here. I mean, uh, the research part, in, especially in the field research, has reduced because of um, uh, I do a lot of field research. I used to do many, many more uh, because of two reasons. One is, of course, last since one year is for Corona problems, so that going out and doing field research is very difficult. So that yes. being temporary, uh, the universities have certain rules and that maybe the it doesn't coincide by encouraging the field research so much, maybe. Mm. So I don't know. So that uh, many times the uh, permission for doing research or those things come very late sometimes. Yes. So um, all those kind of things uh, hamper the uh, and that kind of, so your most of the time goes into following those kind of things instead of concentrating it on doing the research itself. So I still do the research and I do still work on even sometimes the whole night. But the thing is that what you need to do and that what you, so, but the frustration comes when these kind of things take more time. Of, yes bureaucratic things take more time rather than doing that. I, so that is what is the problem. Otherwise, yes. the rest of the, uh, I mean, I still do it, but the other way, it would have been even much better had I not to spend so much time following it up. It does sound frustrating. And many times it, it gets even stopped. Hmm. Mm. So what, what alternatives do you have available to you in, and who might you speak with to speed things up, to have this some of this frustration go away so that your approvals are more uh, done more quickly and uh, so that the field work um, is accelerated? Is, is What comes to mind? Well, I tried everywhere from bottom to top, but things still take time because of they have their own reasons saying maybe no, not enough people, but I don't know. It takes a little too long a time. For example, my last research, I went to Japan, I got a fellowship. So that was my third fellowship from Japan Foundation. And usually they don't give more than one. And uh, to get permission, I go, come back. After one year, I get a permission. And most of the time I'm told you are not supposed to go, but I had, especially even before the night, I kept on waiting before leaving before night. And I've given in time all the papers. Many times mm -hmm. papers don't move here. Sure. So these, are, these are the kind of things which could, you would feel that it should go faster. Yes, it sure and sounds sometimes frustrating. Also, and sometimes for doing group work also you are punished. So that mm -hmm. is what is not, uh, I mean, for Corona time, I'm over 60 and I took for, asked for permission, but the permission never came to go mm. to my house and work online. I mean, whether I work on online, being alone here it, uh, many times, I mean, it becomes very difficult to work during the Corona lockdown. When the government has given the rule or this thing, still it didn't work. And all my salaries, but my all earned leaves are cut. Now I'm going to retire, I'll go with zero money. Yeah. So these kind of problems. So then my most of the time goes into following the top to please, please, and write this letter, write prove this thing, prove that thing, instead of doing the actual uh, research and which will fetch so many things to university. Sure. So many times we in, uh, uh, kind of don't value the work, but we value the, I mean, now uh, so-called rule book. And mm. rule books also are twisted and changed. Even if you're following in one way the rule books, it would have been better. Yes. At least the rules should be made in, in advance. For example, some of the, like, uh, Corona thing, uh, I mean, the vacation changed on the last day of the vacation. Mm. 
so people who are outside can come back. Yeah. Let me uh, let me jump in, and in the interest of time, what haven't you done yet to alleviate this frustration, to reduce the frustration that maybe you could still do? It, you you implied that, or you suggested that you've done top to bottom. You tried every avenue, but what avenue haven't you tried, or or maybe who haven't you spoken with that has power to provide you uh, faster approvals uh, no, the or only, well, only thing is like many others do is file cases against the university or go to the top top most person like chancellor that I'm not yep. done mm -hmm. hoping that what, how does it feel to do that what would it feel like to to maybe um, because say, I didn't this do is... it. Is, I, I didn't do it because I uh, so far is that uh, the reason is that I don't want to be uh, so much of like fighting mode. But is this what are we driving people? Sure. To do that. Well, it sounds that's like it's a resource people, issue. I know people will be. I, I'm, I'm. I'm sure I might be punished for being so open on things. Mm. But I still take chance because I, I always speak out very loudly, very clearly what, what is mm. in my mind. And it's not to punish anybody or not to defame anybody, but to sure. solve the problem. Because sure. if something could be solved and if things could be taken care of, then it would fetch much more to the university. Yeah. You see, and... what, what you saved by what university will say by not paying me salaries for those times and cutting all my on leaves and cutting all my medical leaves also so that I go back with my zero money when I retire within five months now mm -hmm. would be spent if I put a case in spending for those lawyers by then. Sure. So where have you saved? Sure. I don't want university to get into that kind of a mode. I understand. So that's not something, on the contrary, I could have did, uh, done much, much, much better giving in other ways to you. There are and, many, yeah. many ways I have suggested. Like, say, you can use these things to get more projects and earn more from that. Yeah. I hear you're very funding. frustrated. You can earn more from that. Uh, so instead of that, I mean, I'm told that I asked, but I worked so hard to do this, and then you are cutting my salary, and you are cutting mm. my own leave. Now, if I'm taking taking leave, I don't work on those days. Sure. So how I'm I'm asked to work, and then my salary is also cut. That's sick. That discourages people. These are the kind of attitudes. That's why you got 88 uh, percent distinct from this university. Yes. Have you got this kind of this uh, satisfaction from any other university? Oh, I I think so. Yeah. Um, it, it it depends university by university and and what the resources are and who the decision makers are and how much they value certain projects. Uh, so it depends. But uh, yes, there's a tremendous amount of frustration. Um, I yeah, probably yeah. should. Yes, yes. I probably should jump in. Yeah, go ahead, please. Yes. yes. No, I mean, uh, being completely aware of uh, Dr. Balaram's problem. Uh, I mean, we, we, uh, sometimes we are really stuck with the rule books as uh, uh, she has uh, shared. Uh, but okay, I think uh, we are really uh, time constrained. So yes, yes, yes. Ahead, please, uh, thank you. <laughs> yeah, thank you, Padme, for, for sharing and for letting me coach you. Uh, it's a it's a very big frustrating yeah, problem. You. I appreciate but, that. You can suggest what I should do. Can you please suggest what I should do? I would be grateful for that. Well, then I'd be handing you the fish. Um, I don't want to hand you the fish. Uh, it's something that I think that as you explore alternative, uh, that people you haven't yet spoken with, people in power, people who have resource resources, um, talk with others, share this problem with as many people as who can maybe help you come up with a solution. That would be what my suggestion would be. I, I 
I can't, uh, in, the, in my role with limited knowledge of your situation, suggest a solution. And it wouldn't be wise for me to do that anyway. But I think you're probably tackling it uh, from every angle already or many of the angles. And so what I would suggest is um, uh, continue to make this in the forefront of, of decision makers' minds so that you understand, so that they understand the benefits of you getting your research done. If they can understand the benefits to the university even more clearly, maybe, maybe some of this problem will be alleviated. But I know that we're out of time. And so um, thank you so much for doing that. And thank you all um, for, I'm gonna go ahead and just say thank you for the time today. I'm sorry that I, I mismanaged the time uh, so that we didn't have more time. And I didn't know that there were break, weren't breakout room capabilities, so we wouldn't have been able to do that anyway. Um, but I'm so thankful for the time with you all. And my hope is that there is something that you take away from this uh, almost two hours together. Uh, I hope there's something that you take away that you can use and, um, and help you build relationships better and be, per, be uh, more strongly perceived as a leader. Uh, well, uh, thank you, Bob. It's really, I mean, what to say, that it's a mind blowing and uh, knowledge uh, imparting station. Actually, you know that uh, sometimes in the middle of our war, sometimes in the middle of our professions, was, uh, we uh, get stuck with some of the roadblocks and we stumble. But, well, so your tidbits, the tidbits which you have shared, I think we, the, those uh, tidbits will guide us ahead. Uh, so uh, yeah. before uh, wrapping up, uh, do you mind if I take a couple of questions? I mean, I can see in the chat box, there are two questions at least I can see. I mean, sure. it is, uh, understand it's a weekend night. It's Friday night here. So, I mean, we are really the time constant, but okay. Uh, and if anybody needs to go, go, go ahead. You know, if anybody needs to go, okay, feel free. Okay, okay, yeah. okay, thank you. So uh, let me uh, go through quickly over the chat box. And I think I have spotted a couple of questions. Oh, uh, well, one is from, uh, well, uh, the first one is far ahead. Yeah, it's from uh, Dr. Shuja Shaikya. Uh, he has posted one question that for achieving quality in higher education, who should be considered as the sole target to requiring leadership? Administrators, academicians, funders, or policy developers? Is this in the is chat box? Is, yeah, is, it's in the chat box. You have to go, I think, farther up. Farther up. I think okay, let's see. Ah, very good. For achieving yeah. quality in higher education, whom should you be should be considered as the sole target requiring leadership? Um, so, as the sole target requiring leadership, um, I have a, a perspective that all of us have a responsibility to be leaders. And by that, I mean, not the formal, not always by formal position, but by rather by our behavior, all of us could be a great role model. So, um, so set the example, um, share your values and uh, be a great role model, evoke great character. Um, that's one example. Another is uh, to be encouraging to others, to recognize others when they do work well. It, that doesn't have to be the, only the role of someone in a formal supervisory role or, or leadership role. Uh, it could be the behavior of anybody. So I don't, I think that all of these people, all of these roles, administrator, academician, funder, policy developers, all of them have a duty to be, to, to evoke leadership behaviors, to, to be great role models, to be honest and transparent and caring and, um, and inspiring and create safe conditions for people to share and be vulnerable. 
um, as, as uh, Erna's message down below, um, to be sensitive to the, to the diversity, both gender and race and religion, and in every way, um, be sensitive that we all are human beings and need to be treated as someone much earlier talked about humanely. And so I think it's all of our, all of our roles to be, to be leaders um, in the informal or formal way. Okay, um, so that's correct. That's absolutely correct. I can see a lot more appreciative notes uh, just uh, piling up in the chat box. Uh, well, I mean, there is one more question from Urna P. Urna Chakraborty. Yeah. So uh, she has asked the corporate and academic leadership. Oh. Yes. So Pablo has joined. Yeah, I can see. So Urna Sorry. has asked the corporate. Well, Urna, do you want to uh, uh, utter these questions on your own? Oh. Sure, sure, sure. I have no problem. And thank you. Sorry, ma'am, to interrupt. We felt... Um, hey, not um, a problem. It's not an issue, actually. Okay, great. Um, well, no, my oh, question... Yes, right. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Uh, do you want to say hi? No, Quickly? Sure okay, ahead. all right. Okay. No, um, uh, my question was, Uncle Bob, so there's very particular challenges that non-men face, especially in, like, corporate leadership. Yeah atmospheres, academic leadership as well, but like in corporate leadership, particularly, um, particu and it's a bigger problem for women. Uh, women in leadership positions face a lot of sexism. And so as a leadership coach, what's your experience been with trying to like address some of these issues? Yeah, so I'm relatively new as a leadership coach and I've coached several women so far. And in each of those cases, that hasn't been the issue they wanted to talk about. In most of the cases, they wanted to make a, lead, a career change. And so they're talking with me as the, about the uncertainty of leaving their certain environment, the current environment where they are employed um, to something more uncertain, but that is more meaningful or satisfying to them. So while I haven't addressed it, um, as a coach, the, the best posture to take would be to listen and to uh, ask questions and to, um, to better comprehend the issue as it is important to each individual. So there wouldn't be a blanket way, a uniform way to respond necessarily, but to understand each person's unique take on the frustrations or the career challenges with being a woman, for example, in a, in a male, maybe a male dominated workplace so that we can then ask the right questions as coach, um, who might you speak with? Who are other women that you feel you can share this concern with or this frustration with? Um, uh, have you talked with your boss about this? Uh, whether the boss is a male or female, um, those kinds of questions might if, they're take, if, the action, if the person takes action on them, could actually reveal to them that there is a systemic problem or not. If there's a systemic problem, they may choose that their best option will be to leave that workplace because they're not gonna change the system alone, especially if they're at a low level. If it's not a systemic problem, but it's a one-off, maybe one individual problem where there's a sexist male boss, for example, maybe, in conversation with others, maybe that creates the conditions where the person moves to another role working under another boss who's not so sexist. Um, and so uh, every situation is unique, but it's absolutely critically important if it's affecting one's productivity, one's job satisfaction, one's stress, if it's distracting to them and they're thinking about alternatives like leaving, they absolutely need someone, a supportive other, to help them through this problem. And it doesn't have to be a formal coach. It could be just some trusted other coworker in a leadership role or not that they can share this problem with because we don't wanna work in isolation. We don't work best trying to solve these problems ourselves. It would be better to go to trusted others 
and to share it because we're going to hear different perspectives that are going to help us think maybe differently and better about the issue. You're welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Actually, you know, Bob, it's the much needed answer. I was about to ask the same. Okay. But Urna did the job uh, on behalf of me. Thank you, Urna, too. Uh, because most of the time we face a lot of uh, difficulties as a woman. Yeah. Okay. But uh, I appreciate your answer. Well, uh, so uh, two more quick questions because I can see uh, one question from Shapun Kumar Maiti. Uh, yeah. That's the question. Yeah. Is leadership uh, in born quality or can it be acquired by training? So that's one question. The, yeah. the, there's a lot written on this issue, uh, Swapan, and I'm really happy you asked the question. And I'll keep the, the answer short because we're well over time. The, the, the short answer and the evidence behind it is leadership is a set of behaviors that is absolutely can be learned and it's skill based. You do have to have certain intellectual capacities to be able to learn. So, um, you know, a certain IQ threshold is required, but I think that nearly every, nearly everyone, I would say 80% of human beings at least have that IQ or that intellectual capacity threshold to be able to be a leader. To, to be able to be a great leader probably requires a little more intellectual capacity, but, um, Absolutely, leadership is primarily, and the takeaway that I want you to hear is a learned set of behaviors that when practiced intentionally will be perceived by others to be a leader, that you will be a leader if you listen, if you care, if you're competent, if you know your stuff, if you learn the, the, um, the, your trade well, much like a uh, Padmina um, really is an absolute expert in her area of research. That kind of competence is critically important to being viewed as a leader. Um, so there are certain things that you need to do um, to build credibility, but also do behave as you interact with others. So caring, listening, tuning in, supporting others, not just their work, but also the whole person will help your perception as a leader. It absolutely can be acquired by training. And then the last question I see is what is a digital leadership coach? Um, most coaching, um, either internal or external, where they're hired formally outside of a firm, and it's a, it's a, it's a multi-billion US dollar industry. It's, it's a huge industry and it's growing all the time, is done by phone or by Zoom. Um, very rarely face-to-face -face anymore. Uh, in psychotherapy, most of that is still face-to-face, -face, although there's a, there's a lot of what's called telehealth uh, via telephone or Zoom. Um, but in coaching, it can be absolutely effectively done by phone or by uh, a platform like Zoom. So I hope that answers your question, Namai. Nimai. Okay, I and mean, then I think we are done with all this Q&A yes. session. Of course, it is a very brief one. <laughs> But we are, we, as I already expressed, uh, uh, that we are uh, time constrained. Uh, well, so it's a, a mind-blowing experience uh, to listen to you, Bob, because uh, you know that is it's much needed. As I told, that this type of session, uh, most of the time, no matter in which designation we are in, but uh, we need some suggestion, we need some advice. So thank you so very much for accommodating this type of session amidst your busy schedule. Uh, may I now welcome. request, oh, thank you. Yes. Uh, may I now request uh, uh, Dr. Nimai from Roshaha to wind up this session. And okay. I will provide okay. everybody thank the you. slides yeah. too. Uh, most likely VC sir is on the uh, floor. We are fortunate. Sir, are you in the floor? Okay, so in that case, I would uh, yeah, yeah. like to uh, request uh, sir to uh, deliver his words of thanks if uh, if he kindly consent. Sir, are you on the floor? Sir, are you there? I am here. Yes. Okay. Oh. Uh, no, we we we, we are uh, uh, we are uh, looking for. I think Vice Chancellor sir has just joined. So. Uh.
we are uh, really eager to have some of his insights. So, so that's why we are waiting for. Ah, I, 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 yeah. see that, I see his tile. Yes, uh, I can see as well, but. <laughs> uh. but we are finding his, uh, I mean, when Dejin is on the VC Vishwaruti, one name is there in the participants list, but I don't know. Uh, okay. okay, most likely so, it is somehow technical uh, disturbance. Okay. Yeah, sorry, it's not, okay. uh, yeah. So, uh, oh. in absence here, as directed by Honorable Vice Chancellor says, let me uh, take up the last part to wrap up the session. Uh, basically, what my colleague Dr. Saran Isika Maiti told is really, I have no adjective how to address my feelings on the presentation. Be it amazing, be it mind blowing, be it coaching presentation, be it interactive presentation, and be it innovative presentation. It's very, very good and encouraging to all of us. We actually did fail that we are passing two hours. So it's really credit goes to single soldiers to Bob Sir for his efficient, skillful, and expertise on the subject. And this is simply because his care, his. Nimai, may I sir, interrupt sir. you? Yes, I, sir, I sir, please. Head, sir. Nimai? Hey. Sir, 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 please, sir, please. I, I, I can oh. see that, but you can't see oh, me. Did you Yes, hi. I, I, can, oh. I can see you. I can see you, but you can't see me because there are some technical glitches. No problem. So, Half of your family is here. I'm, I'm on the on the, <laughs> middle, the middle of the meeting, so but I just say came to say hello to you, and I didn't couldn't listen to your interesting uh, lecture, but you know my I was represented by my two kids. You must have seen Una is so big, so is Pablo. <laughs> Indeed. So, Indeed. Uh, well, you'll be able to listen to the lecture. It's been recorded. It's a cure for insomnia. I'm sure. I'm sure we'll, we'll be enlightened by a lecture because I don't know whether Nimai has sought your permission because we normally upload it in the YouTube um, so that, you know, it will be uh, spread uh, to the to a wider kind of, you know, listeners. So yes. I'm sure you have no objection if we put it uh, uh, in the YouTube. Yes. The university has a YouTube channel, so we can put it in all the lectures. We just put yes. it in. Even uh, last week, we had somebody from Columbia, a professor of economics. So he gave a lecture. It's the second from the US. And then next, again, we are coming back to India again, and we are going back going to the US. So um, uh, I, I, I must ask you about your family. I'm sure everybody's all right. Yes, but, uh, everybody's doing uh, great. To be, to be in the list of our university lecture series is a great honor, Bob. And um, that gives us a kind of chance to interact with a very dear friend of mine. I don't know how many of the participants know that we are very dear friends. And Bob is very fond of mango with tea. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Bob. And it's Obviously. a great honor. It's a great honor for me to, to be able to, to be invited to, to be uh, with I mean, you all. Bob used to come home in the in the afternoon and used to ask for mango with tea. You know, what a combination. So and that's Sanchita's a, food too, her, her that's cooking. Right, that's right. Well, yeah, sometimes. So, but anyway, <laughs> Bob, you know, I, 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 since I didn't listen to your lecture, so I can't comment on this, but I know that you, know, it, you are a kind of boss in your field. So whatever you have uh, said to our colleagues, uh, I'm sure they must have been enlightened. Uh, they must have been, you know, drawn to an area of research, which is little unknown to our part of the world. I mean, this sort of, mm. that's why I was quite keen to have you and who else better than you can be, you know, uh, 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 can elaborate the ideas on this very peculiar theme of leadership. Yes. And as you know, I mean, I'm now discharging the role of a leader, but here, you know, in our university, we don't believe leadership to be you know, to be bestowed on a single individual because our founder always used to say that we are all kings in our kingdom. So I'm just one of those along with my colleagues. And that's the spirit I always, you know, sustain to bring all of my colleagues together. And I, uh, that way I'm thankful to my colleagues because they always appreciate uh, whatever we do and the lecture series, you know, as you know, today, Sharon is conducting, tomorrow somebody else 
So I said, in, instead of focusing on the vice chancellor, you please, you know, uh, spread it among yourself so that everybody gets a chance to talk to colleagues from outside uh, the shore of India. So that way, I think we are, uh, we are, you know, spreading it out. You know, we would yeah. like to be democratic in the universal sense of the term. You so bet. that way, I think we are very happy to have you amidst us. But um, as Nimai said, Nimai listened to you. I think he is the best person to wrap it up. I told him that uh, because my meeting is so important and it is a very high level kind of meeting for something uh, very special and we are suffering due to that the entire globe. So I'm part of that committee. So um, uh, and as a result, I couldn't you know, shift my attention to your lecture, though it, I was quite keen to listen to you, not because you are Bob, but because of the topic in which I am also interested. But um, uh, with these uh, words again, Bob, thank you very much. And I'm sure uh, we'll listen to you again. And as your friend, uh, I uh, also extend a kind of invitation to you Kerry and uh, your daughter, I forget is the, her name. Kat, uh, uh, Kat, Katie, Kat, Katie. Katie. Yeah. Katie. So Katie yeah. must be a big uh, girl now. So please yes. do come to India. And needless to say, our university will be your first stop when you land I in would India. Love it. And, you know, uh, and, and again, you know, you'll be my guest. The, the entire university will be benefited by your lecture. We'll have a series of lectures. If you are interested, we can have you as visiting professor easily. So just let me know whenever you get bored of Harrisonburg, you know, you can <laughs> land in, in uh, Vishwa Bharati. And I'm sure oh. you love the place that I'm telling you. You love the place. Oh, that's awesome. That's yeah. awesome. Well, thank you so much. Great chatting with you. And we'll, we'll chat another time soon. Sure, sure. So Nimai, to me wrap up. Yeah. Uh, Nimai, may I, make, may I make one comment? Yes, sir. Please. Yes, sir. Uh, I would like to make an offer uh, number one, to provide the slides that uh, everyone saw, um, okay. and I will send them to Namai. Um, and number two, I would like to offer, since we weren't able to use breakout rooms today, so that people could actually practice, mm -hmm. if, if there's a way to use a platform like Zoom and use breakout rooms, I will come back any, when, when we can arrange another time in you know, the next few weeks or months, to actually have anybody who's interested practice. Because I think that is so important to not just hear the content, but actually use it and practice it. So I'd be willing to do that if we can find a way to arrange it. And one way to do it would be on my Zoom link that you could then disseminate. My Zoom link has breakout um, capabilities, breakout room capabilities. And that way, anybody who attends could actually practice. And that's my hope is that we, we all have a chance to practice. Okay, okay, sir, we'll try to follow. And uh, soon after you will send it to me, I will try to distribute it among the, the participants. Okay, sir. And that's also great. we'll, uh, yeah. And we will upload it in our university website too, so that uh, some other people, those who are not able to attend, they may also view if they require, okay. That's great. Yeah. Thank you so much. Yes, sir, yes, sir. And then, uh, then Finally, uh, what I'm going to wrap up, actually, VC sir is a kind of personality uh, who is asking me to wrap up. But after saying VC sir, I think there is nothing to say from my side. Still, as sir asked me to say something, let me just utter a few sentences like that. What I told earlier is that uh, this is a very new kind of session to me uh, because of the topic and the way of presentation and the mode of interaction through poll you have made. So all we are found that you are not JMU, rather you are at Vishwabharati. And every time we are getting a chance to interacting with you in very loving manner, and we are encouragement and enlightened enough on the particular leadership topic how this simply management, scientific management, participatory management, then leadership, then we are thinking about leadership is a kind of coaching. And today you are just unlock the door, how to lead the work, be it academic, be it entrepreneur, be it business and other things. So we are really grateful, sir, 
for your thought provoking illustrious presentation we really remind it for our next course of academic life academic journey we are really grateful sir really grateful and of course thank you, thank you for accepting our invitation i know uh, the, the uh, relation close relation of uh, bob sir's family and chakraborty sir's family so that is why it is possible that we are able to listening world actors people by sit by say, uh, sitting in our santiniketan using this laptop and zoom platform like that so in spite of your busy schedule you are kind enough to give us time and i know that you are starting your lecture in the very morning that is 8 am there so to start the 8 am the session you are joining 7:30 am and before that you have to start your live so bob sir it's a really painstaking to you for us i am again really extend our deep sense of regards for this kind of holistic sacrifice for bisobharati audience thank you sir and thank you i am really ah. yeah and i am uh, uh, this session may not be wrap up if i am not able to uh, extend my deep sense of regards and uh, uh, gratefulness to our vc sir because this is his brainchild to start up this kind of lecture series so thank you sir for your this kind of uh, this kind of thought provoking uh, idea to introduce and for you only we are having accustomed with this kind of lecture of illustrious personalities across the world thank you sir and the participants those who are participated encouraged us thank you for them and of course thanks are also due to uh, our uh, madam saran isika maiti who is soldiering to introduce our speaker and coordinate the session and extra thank due to unna because he has helped me she has helped me for taking introductory time of 10 minutes from bob sir to interact with them i, I actually felt that time what shall i do so she can <laughs> he help me and, no of course yeah and we all, uh, we all enjoyed that conversation yeah, right exactly there. so exactly so <laughs> thank you so, so much sir Shumanda, thank you shomonda and sangeet bhavan we team all, we all enjoyed that thing <laughs> exactly great great so much then uh, my thank colleagues you. professors principals staff of bisvarthi library professionals and last but not least judajit mongol and jishnu mondol my library colleagues without their technical support this cannot be possible from yesterday they are contacting with bob sir and try to make it a grand success of this session so thank you jishnu and judajit for your untiring effort offering technical support and yeah. other staff those who are there to be in the library like sekhar budhi and others so everybody thank you from this side and good morning bob sir there and good evening late evening <laughs> here in india so yes. uh, bob sir with your kind Nimai permission good night yeah yeah good night sir nimai nimai sir sorry ami ekটু কথা বলতে চাই sir sir ha ek second ami apne इूनिटी despite being seriously ill mm. so i think i extend my special thanks to nimai special so thanks sir. to sharan special thanks to my colleagues including shuman because shuman i think started the ved 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 song right vedic song yeah. na no, sir today we are starting with uh, that video song it okay. was uh, so, yeah uh, I, i personally bob in my absence i mean i i'm sure you must have seen the potentials of our colleagues of bishobharati as a university so um, uh, i am really thankful to all my colleagues that they spontaneously participated in this kind of venture because without their participation it would not have been successful i am sure you must have enjoyed interacting with these vibrant minds so bishobharati you have got talents and i i am really grateful to be part of this big family i call it a family because i mean it's just a matter of time that i i am the kind of you know vice chancellor um, uh, institutionally i ho i am the head of the institution but otherwise i consider myself to be just a part of the bigger family called bishobharati 
and mm. uh, that way i am grateful to nimai and his team the computer science department judhaj is a very young guy but very yeah. enthusiastic and whatever we have been doing online it, it continues and it continues without glitches simply because of his technical kind of you know capacity to address it immediately and uh, other colleagues you know you see it's already uh, eight o'clock and they are so mesmerized by your very enchanting kind of lecture i'm sure you know they would have loved to listen to you even if you continued beyond you know eight o'clock so uh, i again you know i i just thank on behalf of bob all my colleagues and obviously bob is a friend of mine so i should not thank him formally because it is a responsibility whenever a friend <laughs> calls another friend a friend responds and that goes to me as well if bob calls me for anything i am there i mean i mean we had a wonderful time in the us and uh, with the uh, kolodonsky family and chakravarti family we are really really very close in heart close in perception and close in thought i think bob nimai is that uh, sir. all may okay, sir it's, it's it's fine it's fine sir no no unnat me ki bolbe no baba pablo didn't get to say mm -hmm. hi to come hi. on say hi say hi hi uncle bob how are you uh, i'm well and you look great you look <laughs> tall <laughs> thank you <laughs> yeah, I have grown taller, much taller, but but yeah, you look. Yeah, he's six foot one now, Uncle Bob. He's really tall. <laughs> Our well, aunt Corey and Katie. They're doing well. Uh, Katie is now in seventh grade, uh, middle wow. school, and uh, she's thirteen and growing, and her hair is down to her waist almost. Mm, um, and you know, we'll have to do. We'll have to have a Zoom session with the family. I love that. True. Let's do that. I remember Katie when she was three years old. I used to carry her around. I can't imagine. <laughs> oh, I can't imagine oh a thirteen-year-old. Oh gosh. Yeah. she's a very articulate young woman, much like you. You were at that age and still are. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I'm sure. With parents like hers, yeah, she'd have to be. But so let's do so a much. Zoom session uh, sometime yeah. soon with the families. We sure. we sure, love sure, that. Yeah. Have a great great morning. Thank you so much, everybody. And again, um, I'm happy to do a breakout session with you yeah. at some point in the near future. And I will send uh, Nimai um, the slides. Okay, sir. Okay. All right. Take care, everybody. Goodbye. Oh, yeah. Goodbye. Take care. Seeing you. Take care. Thanks for your participation. Thank you. This was Bye -bye. great. Thank you so much. Bye. Goodbye. Yeah. So, Mr. Sir, we can uh, leave the meeting. Uh, please, uh, Mondo Koro. Okay. Yes, no. जरिंदमें না কিন্তু আবার আজকে বলছে পজিটিভ সব সিম্পটম আছে পজিটিভ এর বলছে তো আমার সাথে কথা হলো তাহলে তো সাবধানে থেকো আর সবাই সাবধানে থাকবেন যারা আছেন পার্টিসিপেন্ট সবাই সাবধানে থাকবেন কারণ সিচুয়েশন কিন্তু খুব গ্রেভ রাইট হ্যাঁ কালকে একটা মিটিং আছে না মমতা ব্যানার্জি ভার্চুয়াল মিটিং করছে হ্যাঁ ভার্চুয়াল মিটিং মানে ধর ফিজিক্যাল মিটিংটা পোস্টপোন হয়ে যাবে না ভার্চুয়াল মিটিং কিছু লোক তো আসবে না বিভিন্ন জায়গায় জড় তো হবেই না সে তো হবে সেই সাবধানে থেকো নি মায়া হ্যাঁ স্যার হ্যাঁ স্যার হ্যাঁ স্যার ঠিক আছে ভালো ভালো থেকো ভালো থেকো ওকে ওকে গুড নাইট মিটিং হ্যাঁ গুড নাইট গুড নাইট গুড নাইট জিসনু প্লিজ